só um segundo, só um segundo, só um segundo. Quem está a falar uh, uh, aparece, o, o vídeo aparece, okay. automático. Portanto, isto está aqui, está a começar. Pronto. Hello, everybody. I welcome you for this uh, webinar on the topics on climate change and the uh, risk analysis of forest fires. Um, this is an initiative from the University of Coimbra. Uh, it's first of all related to the uh, uh, doctoral degree in uh, mechanical engineering of the University of Coimbra, but it is also related to the uh, program of uh, two research projects that uh, ADAI has in, in uh, ongoing. One is the project uh, Fire Storm on very large fires, and the other one is the project Fire Risk uh, from the European Commission that has just been approved and is going to start in a few months. Um, I would like to greet um, Mike and Emilio and uh, thank them for having accepted uh, my uh, invitation and my challenge to participate in this uh, uh, webinar. And um, um, I would like to say, uh, let's say a few words about uh, these two scientists that are going to be with us in this uh, uh, session. Uh, Mike Flanagan is a very well-known uh, scientist. He uh, works in Canada, he is Canadian, he works in the University of Alberta, where he got his um, uh, degrees. He um, has a background on physics, and then he did a, his a PhD on plant, plant sciences. And uh, afterwards, he has been dedicated all his career to the problem of uh, wildland fire, to climate, and to climate change. Um, I would like to uh, highlight one point in the career of um, um, Mike is his role as editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Wild and Fire. Um, we, most of us, we publish in this journal, which is a very important reference for all of us. And I can tell you that Mike was the person who brought this journal up because uh, some years ago it was uh, not very, very, very good shape, but uh, Mike with his a very good work as editor-in-chief brought this uh, magazine up. We have to thank him for this very important uh, contribution that he gave, among many others. Um, Mike has also worked with us in the International Conference of uh, Forest Fires, and uh, he has been our editor-in-chief for this uh, conference, and I thank him again uh, in this opportunity for this whole. Uh, Mike has a very important activity in the uh, Climate Change International Panel and uh, several other panels uh, in which he has worked and uh, he's a well-known uh, uh, person internationally. Those of you who watched the, the program of the Ge National Geographic on uh, very large fires certainly, certainly remember Mike Flanagan and his face uh, there. I will um, say th the presentation of Emilio later. He's uh, from the University of Alcalá in Spain and uh, among other things <laughs> among the, that I should mention about Emilio is the, uh, the fact that he is the um, leading scientist in the project of uh, fire risk, of which I'm the coordinator and Emilio is the scientific coordinator. I must say that the relevance of this project, its excellence that was recognized by the European Commission was mostly recognized uh, due to his work and to his activity. Um, okay, just to finish the presentation of Emilio as well, I would like to say that he is professor of geography at the University of Alcalá de Henares in Spain, near Madrid, and he has uh, an outstanding career, many publications, lots of work, and he's a specialist on remote sensing and the application of remote sensing on uh, uh, the problem of wildfires. And later he'll speak to us on the issue of uh, risk analysis, uh, integrated risk analysis in, in wildfires. So I think that these two 
uh, conferences that we will have today complement uh, very well each other. Uh, with nothing further, I give my the word to Mike. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Domingos. I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, hopefully we'll see a PowerPoint shortly. Um, getting used to Zoom. Okay. So if there's any technical issues, which sometimes occurs with uh, broadcasts like these, uh, Domingos or Luis, uh, let me know. Um, hopefully you can hear me and see me while I go ahead. Uh, I wish I was in Portugal. Uh, and I look forward to the International Conference on Forest Fire Research next November, 2022. Uh, excellent conference. Uh, I, I just have to mention something. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, but, you know, I did play a role in IJWF, International Journal of Wildland Fire. It's a great journal. I didn't do it alone. Uh, CSRO was a great publisher the social editors, the reviewers, the authors, everyone worked together as a community to make it where it is today. And, you know, with the courage on, it's great. So I'm a fire guy, I'm a weather guy, I'm a climate change guy, and uh, I'm gonna talk about fire and climate change today. And uh, we have a really quiet year in Canada this year, for fire, or last year's 2021 now, but in 2020 we had a quiet year, but I'm from Alberta. We have very active, year 2019, and this is a picture of Northern Alberta on fire. So I'm gonna talk about global fire, the big picture. I, most of my work has been done in Canada or the Boreal, so you, you'll hear a bit about the Boreal, I'm afraid. Then we'll talk climate change, impacts of climate change on wildfire, and what can we do about it, okay? Um, the picture here is uh, Elephant Hill Fire in British Columbia 2017. It was a record-breaking year, and it was what we call hot, dry, and windy. It was uh, Friday afternoon, July 14th, and it was about 35 Celsius. RH was about 12 or 13 percent, and the wind was 30, gusting 40, and that fire where it ended up being 200,000 hectares. We have big fires in Canada. Some over, exceed over a million hectares. Uh, this one ended up about 250,000. And it's, you can see that, I'm not sure if my mouse shows up on these, but uh, you can see it's turning into a pyrocumulant nimbus, a fire generated thunderstorm. So it's extremely uh, high intensity, erratic and potentially dangerous. So globally, we burn about 350 to 450 million hectares a year. I think the latest estimates put us around 420. Um, these are based on remote sensing satellites. And um, yeah, we have no idea how many fire starts there are, but most of them are started by people, probably 95% or more. That agent for ignition is lightning. Uh, largest dairy burns in grassland savannas, but fire is a necessary component, a natural component in many forests and ecosystems. So you actually need fire. If you try and remove it, it's not beneficial for that ecosystem. Now, animation time, let's hope this works. Now this is reconstructed from Muliat and Field. And this is just give you an idea of where fire globally occurs. Now, of course, there's the, the updated satellite record from around just you know early 2000s, 2001, 2002 to present. And it actually shows area burn is decreasing. And this is largely because of uh, some of those African savanna fires are being turned to agriculture. And this is in part, though there's some recent work, and I'm not sure if Amelia is gonna talk about this, but it looks like carbon emissions from fires may still be increasing because there's more emissions from forest fires than there are from savanna fires, but that's an area that's going on. This is a recent paper by David Bowman and others. And I use this graphic just because fire interacts with the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the hydrosphere. There's so many interactions, including with our climate system and uh, top right-hand corner, you know, I, there's a pyro CV, pyro cumulonimbus, fire generated thunderstorm. And I just showed you a picture of one not too long ago. So there's so many interactions um, with fire and our earth. 
So fire management, <laughs> I mean, this is hard to summarize for the globe, but billions of dollars. California alone, I don't know what the total bill for fire management will be, but it's probably two or three billion at least, probably higher. Um, and these costs in many areas are going up. Um, fire management historically in many areas was fire is bad, you put it out, okay? Uh, that is changing in many areas, where especially where fire is natural and things like appropriate response, they call it, uh, sometimes monitor and manage. And it's allowing fire on the landscape when and where possible, but that can be challenging. So fire management is challenging. It's becoming more challenging because of increased demands as well as climate change. So just a little bit of boreal stuff. We have fires from uh, sea to sea to sea. Our records go back to uh, nationally 1919, but they're reliable from 1959 to present. Though some regional uh, data goes back fairly detailed to 1900. And you can see we have lots of fire um, and it's by decade. And yeah, um, some of these areas, uh, for forest areas, the return period is every 30 years, which is, uh, it gets much more frequent than that. Our forest wouldn't survive that, and it goes to shrubs or, or grass. Um, we also have evacuation database, and once again, um, the yellow circles indicate evacuations, where they were, and the bigger the circle, the more people evacuated. Um, and you can see, hopefully you can see, it goes from coast to coast to coast, so it's pretty well all over the country. The green in that diagram shows where our forested areas of Canada. And of course there's people and a human footprint. And this was work done by a, a student of mine now with the Canadian Forest Service, Lynn Johnston. And you can see uh, on the right hand side, that's showing you know, the traditional wildland urban interface with industrial interface, as well as the infrastructure interface like power lines and pipelines. And you can see there's a lot of activity in Alberta, the province I live in, that's the, the kind of like the lighter one on the right-hand side. Um, so when a fire does start, if it grows to any size, it bumps into something that society values. And that's why in some places, it's really hard to let fires burn um, to any size. Like I mentioned a million hectares, you put a million hectare patch on that and you're gonna bump into a community, uh, power lines, pipelines, mines, you name it, it's going to bump into stuff. So it is a challenge that we face. Um, now, fire is kind of like real estate and, you know, location, location, location. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had lots of notable catastrophic fires in the world in the last decade. And some of these are in Alberta. 2017, Portugal, Chile, South Africa, you know, Greece in 2018, and Australia, 2019, 2020, uh, this year, uh, California, Colorado, uh, Australia, the Arctic, the Amazon. Every year we're seeing these extreme conditions and extremes drive the fire business in, in many jurisdictions. Uh, I'll cite Western United States, for example, 1% of the fires burn, 99% of the area burned. And these happen on a relatively small number of critical fire weather days. So another example of California is the Santa Ana winds or Diablo winds in central or northern California. You know, it's just a few days of these hot, dry and windy conditions. So sometimes it doesn't have to be hot, just dry and windy will work. And of course, where there's fires, there's smoke. And I live in Edmonton, that bottle bomb panel there is a, a, a tweet. And Edmonton had the worst air quality on the planet for a while. And it was fires that were mm, about 800 kilometers away. Uh, smoke can be transported around the globe and into the stratosphere, which I um, don't have enough time to talk about that, but these are all important aspects. And of course, from a health point of view, the more we find out about smoke, the more we find out how bad it is for us and work done by Faye Johnston found over 330,000 deaths a year attributed to wildland fire smoke, mostly Southeast Asia because the prolonged peat fire is burning in that region. So uh, here's a picture of smoke from California fires. And you know 
places in British Columbia, province in Canada, had just horrible air quality for a week or two this fall, or excuse me, uh, fall 2020. And you can see uh, this gray stuff, um, this, these are, that's smoke, and it's being sucked into a low pressure system in the Pacific Ocean. It's being sucked into a subtropical low off Mexico. And it may be hard to see, but the smoke is also sucked into a low pressure system in the Eastern United States. And this is uh, on the ground, their quality was just off the scale. And it's, it's really not healthy. And of course, California um, burned over 4 million hectare, no, 4 million acres, sorry, this year, which is over 4% of their land base. And it was uh, by far the biggest year in recent record. And uh, if you look at uh, area burn in California since the 1970s, if you don't include 2020, it increased by a factor of five. If you increase, if you include 2020, it's increased by a factor of eightfold, uh, which is just incredible. So we have a record of carbon dioxide, which is called a greenhouse gas. Um, and we have it from ice cores, okay? So Antarctica, Greenland, um, they drill cores, and there's little air bubbles trapped in these cores. And it's almost like tree rings. You can count down and you get an age of how old it is. And some of these go back uh, 400,000 years. Um, and these air bubbles show the carbon dioxide. And pre-industrial, they were around 270 to 280. And then, you know, people started burning coal and oil and, uh, producing greenhouse gases, and away we go. And this is from Mauna Loa, which is on the big island of Hawaii. And this is the longest continuous record uh, that I'm aware of. It started in the late 50s, and it goes up and up and up. And you can see an uh, annual uh, cycle in there, but it's going up and up and up. And we're about 400 parts per million. And pre-industrial was 270, 280. And... Um, it's gonna to continue to increase, uh, unfortunately. It was a little slower this year because COVID did have an impact, but it still increased two parts per million. Um, Earth has not seen uh, parts per million 415 since about three, four million years ago. So um, we're, we're kind of in new territory. So simply, What's going on here, okay? Where are these greenhouse gases? And some of them are natural, like water vapor and carbon dioxide was here before the Industrial Re Revolution. And they actually help keep our planet a little warmer than it otherwise would be to the point that it's, we're kind of like uh, in the solar system, we're a Goldilocks planet. Uh, Mercury's way too hot with a really big greenhouse effect. Mars is too cold, very little greenhouse effect. And we're just kind of right. But what's, what's going on here? Well, the sun's about 6,000 degrees, if memory serves, um, and it emits most of its energy in short waves, okay? And that comes and it warms the planet, okay? The planet is closer to about 300 degrees K, just a little bit under, and we emit most of our radiation as long waves. Now, the atmosphere, in particular these greenhouse gases, are transparent to the short waves allowing that sunlight in, but more opaque or blocking, absorbing the long waves. So it's like having another blanket on your bed on a cold winter's night. It traps the heat in. How much, how fast? These are all valid questions, but this is part of our Earth system and it keeps us warmer. And if we keep on producing these greenhouse gases, we'll get warmer and warmer. Now, if we get our act together and stop producing greenhouse gases today. Um, this is a good thing, but we'll probably continue to warm for decades because a lot of the heat has been absorbed by oceans and they have long, deep ocean water has long time periods and lags. So we will probably continue to warm, though not nearly as rapidly if we don't. So here's a, uh, a chart showing global surface temperatures relative to 1920. And you can see that uh, uh, the 2020 numbers are coming out. There's numerous databases. Some of them have, have a second place. 
but it was a really warm year. And of note, it wasn't a strong El Nino year. And as a matter of fact, the last part of the year was a La Nina. And typically we don't see these really warm years unless they're in El Nino, which does affect the global climate. So this is uh, not good for us uh, that we're continuing to warm at this rapid rate. And you know, this is uh, showing uh, 2020. Uh, now the baseline for this one is 1951 to 1980, and it's 1.02 degrees Celsius above that baseline. And you may have heard in the news about you know uh, the fires in Siberia and how warm it was. And you can see there's like six degrees Celsius above normal. This is really a significant change. And much of the earth is above normal. There's parts of the North Atlantic and around Antarctica and some of the oceans where it's... it's well, no, get it. Excuse me? I'm sorry. Okay. So, and of note is how these temperatures are changing by latitude. And you can see most of the warming, at least in 2020, and this is actually consistent with many other years, it's these high northern latitudes that are warming. And on the scale on the left, you can see it's four degrees Celsius, and that's a significant increase in temperature. Now, here's showing monthly global temperature anomalies. And you can see the last time the globe was below normal was December 1984, and I actually remember that month. It was it was a cold month uh, in North America and probably many parts of the world as well. And I gave my first talk on climate change in 1985 for my supervisor, and I was on the fence. I, I wasn't sure that you know that atmosphere is so vast. How could yeah yeah we have cities and things, but how could we influence something so vast? Well. Uh, after doing some reading and things like that, I quickly came to the realization that we are changing our Mike, climate. Mike, uh, excuse me uh, for interrupting you. Uh, there is a problem with the connection. May I ask you if you could make a pause? So we will uh, uh, restart in about one minute and uh, you can start, uh, continue from here, okay? If you don't mind. Okay, I don't, I don't have to go back a slide or two. No, no, just stay, stay on that slide, but we need to close this transmission and start it over again. So if you and Emilio and all the rest of people that are watching on YouTube, please come back again in two minutes, okay? Okay. Okay, okay. See you in two minutes.